So welcome to this concurrent session entitled Virtual Care, Kidney Care in 2020 and Beyond. My name is Anurag Singh. I'm a nephrologist in Prince George, Medical Director of Northern Health's Kidney Care Services and Co-Chair for this year's BC Kidney Days. COVID-19 crisis has forced us to adapt quickly and learn new ways to connect with people that we care. As kidney care professionals, we look after individuals who are vulnerable yet need regular clinical care. Our speaker today has been at the center of developing, spreading, and standardizing virtual care through our kidney clinics in BC. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Mike Pavalacqua, who is a nephrologist in Fraser Health with additional training in health administration. Mike also serves as a chair of the Provincial Kidney Care Committee and leads the BC PKD network. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Anurag. Thanks for that, that introduction. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking a little bit more about virtual care, where it is now and where we see it going uh, in the future of renal care. So let's just launch into it. Um, and again, I think we really need to remember to set the stage. Uh, I like this phrase that's been coming out now. People are calling it the before times before COVID, which is from Mad Max, if, you, if you're an old film buff. Um, and I think it's a little bit appropriate, you know, dealing with what we've had to in the last year or so. But it is important, I think, to remember where we've come from in terms of renal care. and. All of our renal care for many years has very much been team-based. It's a multidisciplinary team is a very, very unique thing. It's not just a collection of different people. It's a group of different professionals all united in the same goal of, of uh, enhancing our patient care. And so I have people listed here, and I'm sure I'm missing some that, that are involved in the renal team, but it's a large number of people. And more importantly, it's integrated. It's not different providers all providing care in parallel to each other or independent of each other. It's a team together offering an integrated uh, bundle of care. And, and that might seem like I'm splitting hairs, but it really is a, a, an important difference that's gonna come up as we talk about how we support that in, in the virtual world. And in addition to our team being kind of a, a complex and uh, integrated group, the care we offer to, to renal patients is, is somewhat complex as well. So renal care is, in, is unique in that it's longitudinal care. In many of our patients, it's over many years or even decades, um, but it's interspersed with different events and different trajectories. I kind of like to break up what we offer in our kidney clinics into these buckets of, of services. So we have, we have some tasks that are more education oriented, either to talk about self-management, things like blood pressure, diabetes, you know, et cetera, or when we're talking about more complex things like renal treatment modalities. So we have our education uh, components. We have at times where we go into what I call autopilot mode or, or surveillance, where we're kind of just keeping an eye on things, seeing where a patient is at and then keeping them stable. So that's both in our clinic and between clinic visits. Uh, and then through, at certain times, we'll have our navigation components too. So the most obvious one there being transition to different care modalities. But you know, there are other things they have to access. They have to go see different specialists, they have to get treatments done. So there's a whole bunch of parts where they have to find their way. So that's why I like this picture of peaks and valleys because that's really what our renal care is over the course of someone's uh, lifetime. It's not one steady or constant level of services we're providing, but it goes up and down in these, in these uh, ways. And then we had to change everything. And it's important, I think, to recognize that this is not something that we decided to do. That sounds obvious, you know, when I say it out loud, but, but the reason I'm making that point is that if this was a planned body of work, we would have had a strategy, we would have had an evaluation plan, we would have made, you know, precise changes and then decided and then documented what happened afterwards. Whereas that's not at all what happened here. We were dealt something we just had to, to change rapidly. Sometimes it is worthwhile to reflect just how much has changed or how different this is compared to where we were just six to, to nine months ago. So there's the whole uh, aspect of having ch changes in configurations of our, our clinics, uh, reduced access to, to providers. Uh, that one I think is key that we're recognizing more and more. There's both real reduced access and perceived reduced access. There's reduced access to our kidney team and some patients are struggling with reduced access to their primary care providers. And the combination thereof can be quite a, quite a difficult one to manage. And there's a whole host of human factors. And I want to list that one because I think we all think about the ways that our formats and our clinics have changed, but there's also the impact it's had on people. Our patients are a very heterogeneous group of, of, of people. They're all come from different backgrounds. And because of this, they have different ways and different comforts in accessing our new methods of care. 
Um, our team members themselves also have different levels of comfort and different level of abilities to, to adapt to these. And even nine months out, everybody's still, I think, a little bit anxious and uncertain. And, and it's important to recognize that because that does play into to, to what we're expecting of people. How do we bring that previous philosophy of multidisciplinary renal care that we've had for so many years since it served us so well, how do we bring this into the virtual setting? I think this is, this is the item that we really want to talk about here. And we've always had this concept in the past when we're talking about treatment modalities of finding the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And so here the mantra that I'm going to when we're talking about virtual health is that now we have to also think about how do we find the right visit type for the right patient at the right time. And this is a decision that we're gonna to have to make over and over and over again, essentially every time we're interacting with the patient. So let's split this up a little bit. So for visit types, we now have actually a buffet of options available to us. It doesn't sound like much, but there is actually quite a few formats when you start breaking this apart. So of course we have in-person visits, which have something that's served us uh, uh, for quite a long time, although our in-person visits now do look different than what they looked like before. But even our virtual visits, it's worth remembering that there's several different ways this can happen. So phone is a type of virtual visit. The patient's not with you, so you can be doing it by phone. We have our traditional telehealth setup, what we call facility-based video conference, where the patient actually physically goes to a facility, goes to a special room that has the hookup and does their video conferencing visit. There may or may not be a, a care provider there as well. Or they can do video conferencing from their own home. And the reason that I'm saying there's actually a buffet of options is that actually when you think about it, there can be any permutation of those things. Because in a lot of settings, different staff are seeing patients in different ways. So it might be that I decide that I'm gonna bring them in to see the patient physically as a physician, and maybe the nurse will see them physically as well, but the dietitian is still calling them by phone. Maybe the social worker has a video call with them. And so that's, so that's why I had this little picture of permutations on the side, is that it can really be any combination of those things that's contributing to what we would previously have called one clinic visit. We've really need to, I think, be quite honest about this. There's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. And I think we need to have a frank conversation around this. The good, and I really, really want to emphasize this, is that it's almost unheard of the amount of change we've made in a few weeks, in a few months to keep people safe. And I really want to you know, congratulate everyone on that. This is completely unprecedented and everyone's done a stellar job to make sure the patients can still be cared for. But there are some other advantages with virtual care. They can be faster, some of these virtual visits. They can be more convenient. And one of the things we've learned is it can facilitate some supplements to in-clinic care, like webinars, you know, things that people can attend uh, without having to come in. And there are webinars are better attended than they ever have been. So those are all positive things. But there is some bad, and I think some people have realized this. The main one that I see is that the novelty's worn off and people are sick of phone calls. Both patients and, and staff are sick of talking to people on the phone or by video. One of the advantages of the virtual care is that it can be quite fast or efficient, but the downside is that you might lose all of that efficiency spending uh, time doing IT support or what I call air traffic control, making sure the right person is talking to the right provider. We've already talked about the, the difficulty forming relationships and part of it actually that I worry about the most is that some patients just can't engage to the same degree. And it's not a fault of their own, but some people are just able to talk on the phone and, and have a good visit. Other people just can't. And I think we've all recognized that. And then there is, of course, the ugly. Um, you know, we know that in many situations, virtual visits are just not good enough. We're still awaiting evaluation to tell us this for sure, but we know it's not a replacement. And so in a lot of cases, the type of visit we're having is not the type of visit we want. And, and that's a bad feeling as a care provider. I, I think it's important to remember where we came from and to think about how we're going to, to bring this into the future and do this in a, uh, an objective type of way.